up, everyone? <laughs> welcome to Ginger Runner Live, episode number 387. Very fun show tonight. We get to welcome one of our dear friends, Chrissy Mail, uh, back to the show. She's a race director, an ultra runner, uh, coach, and an author. We're going to talk to her about a lot of the stuff that she has upcoming, including the return of the Chuck and at 50K. After a couple of years, due to the pandemic, that race hasn't been able to be held. And uh, uh, Chrissy's bringing it back. The whole crew is bringing it back. And it starts... Ooh, in a couple of weeks, just a handful yeah, of weeks away. Up. And it is Chrissy's 20th year as the race director. And I want to talk to her about that on tonight's show. The longevity of that race and being a race director, the connection and all that stuff. It's a big milestone for her uh, and just being a race director in general. So it'll be a really exciting conversation. Welcome, everyone, to tonight's episode 387 with Chrissy Mail. The show begins now. Ginger Yay! What is up, everyone? I left you hanging. You did. That's the first time in 387 <laughs> episodes. Why? I don't. I actually don't think I've ever done that before. Should we? You want to try it again? No, it's okay. Yeah, uh, totally. I was. I actually was reading a comment how we were both wearing like dark colors, and we disappeared into the, the background. background. Yeah, we're gonna fix that. <laughs> we're we're still. Uh, I'll reveal some of my lighter colors that I'm wearing. If you're new to the channel, or even if you've been here for a while, but we are we're changing up the backgrounds. We have the new uh, GRHQ studio basically being built right now. Yeah. If you saw my review that went live ooh, yesterday. Uh, brand new review with a brand new background. The entire set was uh, is basically being fleshed out. This is still a bit under construction behind us, but um, it's it's getting dialed in. So excuse us while the color behind this is dark and we're wearing dark. That's actually our mistake. We both were like, are you wearing dark today? Me too. Let's do it. <laughs> Whatever. At least you're wearing a bright hat. <laughs> so the only thing that pops out is our heads. Floating heads. That's all that matter. Uh, welcome to the show, everyone. Thank you for taking some time out of your busy schedules to spend a little bit of it with us. Happy Monday. We're doing uh, a Monday show tonight because our guest, Chrissy Mail, uh, is very, very busy. Uh, as I mentioned in the pre-show there, she is a race director, a coach, uh, an author, an ultra runner. And we're going to talk to her all about that on tonight's episode because the her race that she race directs, checking up 50K, probably one of the most well-known 50Ks out there. She's been the race director of that race for now 20 years. This is her 20 year anniversary as a race director. And uh, due to the pandemic, they haven't been able to host that race for a couple of years, but it is back. We're very excited about that. Uh, totally sold out event and it's gonna be super awesome. But we're gonna talk to Chrissy about being a race director uh, for so long, what she's learned over the years, what this race means to her and to the community um, in Bellingham, Washington, plus so much more. She has a new edition of the book coming. Yes. We're going to talk to her about that. Uh, coaching and, and setting intentions is something we were just talking about before the show. So we have a very exciting show ahead for you tonight. Episode of uh, uh, number 387. Not only do we have the amazing guest, Chrissy, tonight. Not only am I here with you, but there is also Kim, <laughs> the wonderful Kim. How are you? Hi, everyone. Hi. I, maybe it's because it's a Monday. I feel like a little rusty today. Yeah, because the last two days have been weekend i guess so i mean yeah. we went hard this weekend we did go hard this weekend uh welcome to the show everyone kim tashima newberry here as always if you're new say hi in the chat room we have lots of fun chatter a lot of folks are already talking about chrissy's book yeah a lot of folks very excited uh, uh heather in the chat room is saying 27 days till chocolate so people are people Counting are down. very very excited counting down uh for those uh, uninitiated or maybe just don't know, Running Your First Ultra is the name of Christy's book. We're going to talk about it tonight because she has a new edition coming. So we'll talk yeah. about like the changes and how you know she's adapted her book and maybe modernized it or, or brought it uh, to 2022. Um, in addition to, of course, uh, welcoming Chrissy here in just a couple of seconds, we do like to recognize members of the community that help us do this show live week after week. We are now 387 episodes into this. We've been doing Ginger and Her Live for about five or six years. Uh, it's also spawned the birth of our daily live show called Daily Brew. Uh, it is our GR crew. It is because of them that we're able to do this. So big shout out to our GR crew. We are very, very appreciate, appreciative of them. Two individuals in particular at that top tier. 
Rick Bjarnason and Brian Sands have been huge supporters for a long time. They're both ultra runners themselves and training for their big events right now. And uh, we just like to shout them out at the beginning of every Ginger Runner Live episode and a tip of the hat to them. Uh, thank you, GR Crew. If you'd like to join the GR Crew, it's very easy. Patreon.com slash the Ginger Runner. Uh, all tiers get access to our after show tonight, our archived after shows. Uh, $5 and above a month get access to our daily live stream, which is we talk about everything. I've with been some running jokes lately. <laughs> Kim's been on a joke <laughs> trend. So you really want to just sign up for that. That's worth it alone. Um, let's bring in our guest, yeah? The let's incredible Chrissy Mail coming to us all the way from like a couple hours north of here. But here she is. <laughs> Chrissy Mail. Yay. Hello. Hi, hi. Welcome. Hi, hi. <laughs> hi, hi, hi. So before you even get started, I want to make sure that everyone can hear Chrissy, make sure that the audio is crystal clear. Uh, because last week we had a bit of a, it's my fault, technical <laughs> issue with audio. For some reason, one of our guests could not be heard, but I want to make sure everyone can hear Chrissy. So Chrissy, uh, where are you coming to us from? We'll just start with that so we can test the audio. But where are you coming to us from? There we go. I'm up in Bellingham and this is my office in the Prime Sports Institute. I share this with one of our good friends, Gretchen Walla. And we have a full like recovery center and everything downstairs that I need to go make use of more often. But Miss Petey <laughs> Pup gets to hang out with oh, me all day. Oh, <laughs> oh, <thank> <laughs> it makes it look like it's a really hard day of work for her too. But yeah, I hope everybody can hear. I'm excited to be here. It's awesome yeah. to see you guys. We're, we're totally good. It sounds like everyone can can pick up the audio. So that's great. We're, we're testing a new system tonight. And the fact that it works actually like reduces my stress from like 95% stress to 73. Yeah. Somehow last week, our guest from Brazil, we could hear just fine. Uh, but our guest from uh, like two, 20 Seattle miles away. Area, like we just could not hear. <laughs> yeah. um, so Chrissy, it is, it is so great to have you back on the show. Uh, let's just start with a huge congratulations. 20 years as the race director of Chuck and Nut. That's a huge milestone, a couple of decades. You've been in this industry for a long time, probably a lot longer than, than uh, you've been an ultra runner and an adventurer for many, many years, obviously, a lot longer than some people maybe have run ultras. And I'm curious how you have seen the sport change and evolve but also from the perspective of a race director, how maybe you have changed and evolved as a race director and how you want your events to be directed. Let's start there. Mm. I think we could spend a whole episode on how this sport <laughs> <laughs> has changed and evolved. We didn't have even Ginger Runner Live, like any kind of online, you know, this was kind of even before social media that I got into this whole sport. So I don't, I won't go into too many of those details, but I really like the idea of talking about the race because I think back to those first years when I like had all my friends from like high school and college come and write people's finish times on a clipboard in the pouring down rain. I bought those plastic sheet recover, uh, sheet covers to protect the results or like tearing tags off of bibs and hanging them on a cord to make sure we got the results right to like chip timing and food trucks and big blow up archways. And oh my goodness, it's like a totally different like scene, but then the vibe is still the same. And I think that's like probably the coolest thing that this race seems to hold on to, even though those like technicalities have shifted in advance, like sure. the community, like, I guess a big part of it was I, I lived away for a lot of those 20 years. I lived in Seattle and Boulder and Bend, and I'd come back and put on the event. So for a long time, people didn't know who the race director was. They just knew the Chuck and at 50 K happened the third weekend of March. Mm. And when I moved back to Bellingham in 2015, so 2016 was the first race I put on from like living here, people would just say like, our 50k or the Chuck and up 50k. And I was like, gosh, this is amazing. Like I get to walk into an, I mean, I mean, I've been doing the event, but it's like this community owned thing, this entity on its own. I, I, I'm really thankful for that. So even with all the changes, there's a lot of good things that stay the same. I can imagine just the, the popularity of the sport obviously has grown immensely just in the last five years. Uh, let alone the last 10, 15, 20 years, but also sort of the spectacle around events. And I'm curious, one thing that Chuck and I has really managed to hold and is sort of the icon for, you know, Kim and I talk about it 
often on how Chuck Knut does such a fantastic job of being an all-star world-class event, but keeping that community vibe. I mean, you, you still have like food trucks and uh, vendors at the finish line and it is, you know, a bigger event. You have hundreds of people that run it, but it still has that small town mountain town vibe uh, and compared to events that are getting bigger and there's more spectacle behind it, how do you manage to keep Chuckanut from growing and, and becoming what we're seeing other big events become? I don't know that I honestly have an answer to that. Like mm. I want to th- like my intention for the in- race, the guys, Tyler Pooley and Kevin Douglas that have been on my team for five years now we, we, with the two years, like we got canceled in 2020. I was on the phone with you guys a bunch that year. That was so devastating. Um, So in 2020 and then in 2020, so we'd already planned the event. We'd worked together. Everything was done. It was like one, we actually ended up doing even more work because we had to backtrack and cancel and get our money back. So we could then refund runners. And so it turned into a whole nother piece of race directing. And then last year with the virtual so we kind of lost track, like how many years, like, do I count those? Of course we do. Those were a ton of work. Um, but I, I feel like that, like it's an energy thing almost, which is kind of sounds like a woo woo answer, but I don't know <laughs> that it's, it can, I can like give credit to anything specific other than like our intention about how, like when we make decisions, it's with the community in mind. So maybe that just keeps carrying through in the, the energy of it. I mean, I love uh, thinking of it. It's an energy thing. And your answer of, well, that's kind of a woo woo answer. Part of me, like, yeah, I, it it's legit. Sense. It makes yeah. sense. I like, I like a bit of woo woo in my life. I'll be the first one. <laughs> Everyone could use a little bit more woo woo. Um, right? I, you, you say that, and it's true. You stand at the start line of, of Chakana and you feel that energy. And whether you're towing the line, you're going to run it, or whether you're a spectator. We spectated the last few years that it was held. And it, you can't help but get caught up in the energy of Chuckin. I know every race has that, but mm-hmm. there's something special about Chuckin up because the, it, it maintains its localness while simultaneously being a destination event. And so it's really cool because you get this this really great uh, sort of world of runners from people who run on these uh, these trails in this course every weekend to people who've never touched it before in their lives or who've never been to the Northwest before. We have a number of crew members that are going to do check out this year. And it's going to be their first time to the Pacific Northwest, which is like Please come say hi. <laughs> best introduction <laughs> ever, L- right? Yeah. yeah. And speaking of good energy, Tiger Claw was like my first race back in four years of running last October. Talk about good energy. <laughs> I was like lip syncing out there. I just had <laughs> fun with you guys your crew like everybody down there has an awesome vibe we're you know we're continuing to try to grow it but we take you know every note from your book that we can as far as race directing because you know chuck and set the bar and it, you guys set it so high that tiger claw is just hanging on hoping to like try to accomplish <laughs> as much as chuck and it does it. Awesome. <laughs> but we really do look to, look up to people like yourself Chrissy and you mentioned just briefly at the beginning of the pandemic like we were on the phone a lot with each mm. other and on emails just trying to figure out like what the heck is going on yeah. and I think we were kind of looking at you like we need to we need to you know Chrissy's leading by example and this is helping us and it was great to kind of have that small uh community of race directors helping each other during that time yeah and I I do want to go back to that uh, 2020 because you were one of the first to have to make the call to cancel the event. And yeah, because your event was, yeah, the a week month, in March, yeah, right? basically yeah. Month, a month before ours, uh, two mu- about a month, and, month a half. and a half. Yeah. So we were, as Chrissy mentioned, we were on the phone a lot or in email a lot trying to figure out like what, what the hell do we do? Mm. How, how has that affected the event or, or what were those? You know, because that's two years in a row that, that you had to cancel uh, for, for of course, all the right reasons. We've talked about it on the show before. How did that affect you as a race director? What you you mentioned that you put in all this work. So, yes, you have to count those years because <laughs> there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes that people may not realize. And the virtual and side the virtual of events as well, because well, that, that for sure, yeah. that requires time. So what were those two years like for you? And and kind of walk us through what that's like as a race director to have to make those calls 
Oh man, do we have to go back? No. <laughs> we, don't, we don't. We can look at where we are now, and we yeah, can reflect. So let, let, maybe let's reflect oh, back yeah. rather than travel back yeah. and relive. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I just remember being devastated, and I think mm. it's some. Sometimes I wonder if it's hard for. Maybe this is part of how Chuck and it keeps its vibe. It's the only event I do every year, and so some race direct the race directors take on multiple events a year. And I don't know what that does, but I feel like putting all my eggs in this basket, I just, I go all in and I get to go all in and then I get mm -hmm. to take a big break. And I think that big, big break is really like make what makes going all in again the next year possible and makes it sustainable for me year over year. I don't know that I could do the same level of event you know, two or three more times in the same calendar year. Sure. So, but that same energy when it got canceled, I mean, it was, it was devastating. I mean, I remember being in tears when I, um, I actually took my headphones with me. I don't run with headphones very often and listened to Ensley's announcement that day when he was going to make the call on group size and he made it to 250 or more had to be canceled. And I just I stopped in the middle of the trail and I was like, well, this is a good place to have this happen. Cause I love being outside. And then I yeah. just sat like bald, called my mom. <laughs> like, Anyways. So I just, the true emotion that I feel for this event, it's a like partnership relationship. And to have it canceled was, was really, really hard. And then equally the next year to make the call to go virtual, I'm really thankful for my team. Like we've got, we've got the in-person down. Like it's, it's, we feel a little rusty. I myself especially feel a little rusty coming back this year, but we've got this down. The virtual was creating all new, a whole new platform. All Like yeah. why, why are we going to do it? How are we going to do it? Working with you guys on the, like making announcements and awards like public so that there was like, how do you create that finish line vibe in this virtual world? And Ginger Inner Live was such an awesome platform for us to get to do that. Um, and the cool carryover is those segments that we created. So our virtual event was these, like we segmented out the course based on aid stations. Yeah. So in January, there were six segments, you know, start to aid station one, aid station two, aid station three. And so we mapped it out, gave the mileage, gave the elevation profile. And so people could either mimic it on their own trails or they could come and run or if they were local or whatever, look, run here. Well, we saw in March that people that had done the six segments in January and the two segments in February were ready for the 50K. And they had multiple, it was mostly women, but multiple women come up to me and say, I never would have thought I could run a 50K. Wow. But this whole thing that you put together and got me through not only the pandemic set me up for something I never thought possible. So we actually brought those, the January and February segments forward as kind of like, I won't call it a virtual training plan because I'm a coach and I would not say six segments and two segments is enough to be ready for a 50K. You have to like <laughs> do the other training too. But I, like just kind of motivational pieces to keep people on track for the March 50K. So something that was extra work, we were able to then carry forward and make a part of our event now. So that was kind of cool to have that come out. I, w I mean, that's sort of like a perfect dovetail into where I wanted to, to take that conversation is because, yeah, we've had two years of lots of work that resulted in no event being able to help be held uh, in, in both of our cases, right? Tiger Claw and, and with, mm -hmm. with Chuck and I, and it's when you, that is the only event that you direct and you want it to be the best, it is, it's heartbreaking when you have to make mm -hmm. that call. Um, but you did manage to create something really cool and fun and innovative. And it is such a great uh, supplemental event to your in-person event that you're going to be able to host now uh, in March. So I'm curious, as a race director, what did you maybe take out of this pandemic that you will either continue on uh, in, in the Chuck and Nut realm or uh, just you as a person? What, what have you been able to take out of it that maybe has prepared mm. you to, to tackle the, the years to come? Okay, this might come off a little funny, but I've never really liked scooping things out of bowls at aid stations. It's just, it's kind of gross to me out always. <laughs> I'll be, like, you know, where, where are we going with I, this I'll here? I'll be totally honest. I was like, she, it's going to be something woo-woo because it was like, yeah. Yeah. you know, I don't like scooping things out of bowls of life. Right? I was like, <laughs> what is... This is going to be a woo No, I'm thing. very liberal here. I am so, so on board with you. I'm so on board. 
so like I feel like I have every like reason in the book to come up with a different way of serving food at aid stations. And I also have my whole like zero or towards zero waste initiative with Chuck and So trying not to have excess. So I was actually on the front phone with our friend, Adam Huey, um, that works on Cascade Crest. We know and him. they did like, the, yeah, he's a good one. Um, <laughs> did like little Dixie cups and I'm like but Adam that's more stuff like I so I'm we're trying to think of ways that we can not have more stuff but also not have hands pulling chips and M&Ms and stuff out of bowls one of my ideas I don't know if it'll happen this year but you know in the bulk food section where they've got those bins that you just pull the handle oh yeah then how do you get those out at aid stations but I feel like that could be a cool way to do it and you just have to wipe off the handle and be clean yeah, and like, do people just hold their mouths open? <laughs> like, that's perfect. Solution solved. Yeah, nothing I'm on perfect. Amazon right now ordering these bins. One of the things that worked well for Tiger Claw, even though I know it was it was hard when we did Tiger Claw in October because we felt the same thing. Like we're working towards less waste, but because of the pandemic, it's we're using more Dixie cups and more things that we're gonna have to be throw either thrown away like or individually packed, like individual things. Um, yeah. One of the things that was kind of a small item that we were able to get compostable for our like cupcake uh, papers. Like muffin mm-hmm. papers, yeah, muffin, muffin papers, and you can get compostable uh, versions of those. And we were able to do single portion things just sitting on like. Oh, like... You're talking. And they make the uh, you know a Dixie cup is covered in wax and doesn't mm-hmm. you know even though some of them most of them are compostable they still take up volume. And if you're running mm-hmm. running with them and you have like pretzels or whatever and you crumple it down, it still takes up space in your pack and it's you know cumbersome. The mm-hmm. The cupcake tins or the muffin papers, papers, compostable, they crinkle down super small, easy to to keep in your pack and not feel like you're carrying a bunch of garbage. Yeah, that was one of those weird, like, we don't want to make more garbage. Yeah. You know, it was a solution for us. Yeah. And it actually works out quite well. And it's kept our actual, like, the food waste down as well. Because, you know, Mm -hmm. you have a bowl of pretzels and lots of hands in there and you end up wasting food by the end of the day. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Ooh, I, I got to write this down. I have a meeting tomorrow. I'm bringing it up. <laughs> I'll make the, yeah, make a bullet point for that meeting. Muffin papers? Uh, people Muffin be like, papers? What a, what a great... Here's a woo-woo idea. Here's a woo-woo idea. <laughs> um, you come from a very unique perspective as a race director as well, where you are uh, one of the best ultra runners in the world. You have a number of wins under your belt. You have a, a resume that <laughs> speaks for itself, but you also just brought up that, uh, you did your first race, uh, in four years at Tiger Claw this last October. It was amazing and an honor to have you run our race yes. as that, uh, race, but also like so cool to see you race. I am curious what you as a, a, a runner who's actively participating in events or at least peripheral peripherally <laughs> what you are looking forward to now uh moving forward are you looking towards races that sort of speak to you in a certain way are you looking towards events that are you know bigger and bigger are you looking for longer distances you know what's what is your sort of outlook on what's going to draw you to an event that you're going to participate in as an ultra runner versus an rd I feel like that actually is, um, finishes that last question of like, what did I take out of it personally coming mm-hmm. out of the pandemic was I had, uh, I did that Gaoli Gong 165 kilometer race in China, in March of 2018. And I remember having this, like, I feel a little obnoxious saying this this way, but I'd say it this way all the time when I tell a story is like a mic drop moment. Like I finished on this amazing boardwalk. There's laser lights and smoke and music and all this craziness. And they put this big bell around my neck and I was first woman, 10th overall, just 40 years old, been racing for 20 years. And I was like, I'm out. Like, this is an amazing (laughs) way to go out. You know, they're asking like, are you coming back next year? And I just kind of maybe, I don't know. But I just was like so confident in that moment. And then I was like, well, kind of like one of those things you finish a hundred milers, you say, I'm never going to do this again. And then a month later you're looking for a race and signing up and it didn't come back. Like I truly held to that, whatever that sentiment was that settled in right there at that finish line hung. And I feel like the pandemic gave a, even more space from it, like forced. And so when it came time, like, as we like started talking about events in the running community, I felt like myself come back in a different way. Like it's not, 
I don't know if it's this, it's the same vibe. I don't know that I ever thought myself competitive, but I obviously was like, I get on starting lines and I wanted to do well. Yeah. So I guess what I, I bring, I'm bringing back to it is, it's like, how do I race in this body that's been doing these things for 20 plus years? Mm. And as a female in my now mid forties, what is that? racing body like i don't recover the same way i don't fuel the same way like what i have like stressors in my life are different than they were that you know those previous two decades so it's like more of a curiosity of what like this phase of life sounds so old um feels like but with 20 years of racing at a pretty high level under my belt is that a good thing is it a rough thing is it something like i i honestly don't know so i actually am signed up for the me walk 100k which is the weekend before tiger claw which means i get to come volunteer at gretchen's aid station at tiger claw yes. <laughs> um and i'm i'm really like interested to see how it goes i'm coached by david roach as well he writes a a training plan that i try and follow i'm i'm probably not the best client it's so funny <laughs> but i but i do really appreciate having like his his like ideas down that i then try and squeeze into my week and i don't have to create my own because I'm writing schedules for 40 other people. Right. And so I, re- I want, I, I really appreciate like his uh, outside perspective in on what might get me ready for me walk. And I'm, yeah, I never had a coach in those 20 years. So to just follow what somebody else says, as opposed to what I intuitively thought I was supposed to be doing, like it's all different. Yeah. And I I'm actually, for that reason, really thankful for that pandemic to force that extra space and break so, and then like seeing this come back and like tiger call, like I said, was such a great like test of that in a way, just cause it, I really remember, like, I was so joyful, like ridiculously through my, out of my own head joyful. I was like, this is why you love running. And this is why you love racing, like podium or not. Like it's great. I think it set an example for our runners, uh, for us as well. Um, when you get to say that you have Chrissy mail lining up at your race, it's like, Oh shit. Like we've got one of the best and, and one of the people who's been in this sport, uh, for a long time, like knows everybody. Um, and so to have you there was such a, such an honor, but it did so, so much for so many others that you may not realize, uh, people who were racing behind you or in front of you and just know, like, (laughs) Chrissy Mail's on this course with me. Um, a lot of people that have had have your book and train through your book as well, because I know a lot of the GR crew um, do that. Yeah, yeah. And that you know, I think that's a really good sort of transition into the discussion of of coaching. You are a coach. Uh, you are coached as well. We we've talked to you, I think, about this on the show before, where we also come from a background of like, I never had a coach. I was always doing my own thing and and just kind of what my body's telling me to do. And now that we have a coach, it feels like, oh, this is great to not have to worry about the structure. And I can, you know, tell David today's not a good day or today I, did, I went longer or whatever. And him, he's able to adapt in that realm. As a coach, do you do you feel like you take uh, uh, being I'm trying to think of how to word this correctly without stumbling over my own words, which I'm already doing. Um, you did a great job. Are you? <laughs> are there keys that you're able to take from being coached and use that as a coach, or vice versa? As a coach, are you able to take maybe how you coach and apply that to how you are being coached? I guess. Like, is there a dynamic mm-hmm. there that you're mm-hmm. able to sort of uh, to translate one way or the other? I feel like that translation or whatever that dynamic started when we were on those podcasts together we did the ultra or science of ultra with sean right. bearden and Ian charman and so before i even asked david if he would want to write a schedule for me we had all these great conversations of how we thought like how we went about our coaching how are we like whether it was from relationships to the science to writing up actual training plans to the back-end tech side like we were able to like talk through a lot of that stuff. So then I think it was like for my 42nd birthday, I was like, do you think I, (laughs) that was when we started was, I think that's the first date on that long, you know, spreadsheet that he, that he puts together. And I, so a lot of that was kind of already figured out, like, because we'd been in those conversations and then um, I think following forward, 
I mean, David's energy, he's been on your show a bunch, is infectious, right? Yeah. And I feel like I'm a, I'm a pretty positive person and I have like a good outlook and I want to share that energy with people. And then I interact with David and I feel like I've got so much to learn. <laughs> like, <laughs> like I just, I really, I thrive in that kind of exchange. So um, if anything, I try and project that like positivity, energy, and belief in my clients. And I have all of those things and just like remembering to say it kind of thing. Like I have that and like just making sure that they know it. Like I want to hear from you. I want to talk to you. Like those kind of notes, I think is probably something I've pulled from him. Even if he just writes, you're amazing. Like just let people know what you think. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's funny that you mentioned that because I, one of the main things that we really love about David, and of course we have him on the show all the time. So we get to tell him to his face, but is that just that positive reinforcement, which I think it's not that it's lacking in coaching, but it is something that, uh, especially athletes who maybe aren't front of the Packers, like him and I are clearly not winning races, but uh, speak for you. Speak for you. Okay. I'm speaking for myself. <laughs> I don't know. I like being encouraged. I like having someone say you're doing awesome. Even if, yeah. it, even if that's all the note that I get for that day, it feels good <laughs> to go. Yeah. Today I did do awesome. I should feel proud of that run that I did that might seem mundane or simple, or I, I executed whatever number I was given, but something so simple can go so far. Uh, shout out to Eric Paramount for the super chat. We appreciate you, Eric. Uh, we love the super chats, man. We, we really appreciate you jumping into the chat and, and supporting the show and everything like that. He also has a question, which we can get to either now, or if you want to hold it, whichever one. Yeah, let's hold it for a little bit later. A little bit later, because now I want to start talking about the book. We're, we're talking about coaching, what you're able to, to absorb from David, but also translate to your athletes. You've written one of the best books in the sport on how to run your first ultra. We obviously... Um, we love that this show reaches an audience of people who maybe haven't run an ultra before, maybe are, are testing the waters of longer distance, whether mm -hmm. that's, you know, for anything from 10 miles on up. So we have a lot of people who get turned on to your book and go, oh, wait, there's an actual kind of guide to help me train for my first ultra. Uh, the second edition, the new edition of the book, I'm really excited about. We'll get our hands on it, I believe, in the next week or two. What mm -hmm. should we expect from it? Because it already kind of served as a fantastic guide for people looking to get into the sport. We, the number of people that we know that have used it as their and it, that their their guide to get to the ultra yeah. distance, I can't even I can't even tell you how many. So I'm curious what the second edition is going to bring. What evolved? What changed? What what grew? What should we expect? Mm. Thanks. Well, the book has been such a gift. Like you made that note of how many people have used it, and people listened. I put a call out in there to say. I'd love to hear your stories, like how this either helps you or like from your ultra, send me a photo. And people do. And they always come like on the days I need them the most. I so appreciate it when people like shoot me a note. And you you said your G, um, your crew has like ordered the book and used it. Your wow. crew has also pre-ordered like, and people listen, I've been putting out, um, if people send me their receipt, I'll send them a book plate and like a little, um, a note thing. So a lot of them have said, I heard about you guys from Ethan and Kim. So thank you to your crew for supporting the pre-order part of this. It actually got prolonged. We were supposed to release January 11th and now the release date is March 8th. So like all, everything got pushed back. I don't yeah. know if you heard about the big ships out in the Atlantic that <laughs> tossed some uh, crates around. Uh, my book was on one of those ships. Oh, and no. Thank oh no, are you serious? <laughs> Isn't that crazy? It's like Porsches just, and your oh, book. Yeah. <laughs> Luckily, it didn't go in the water. They just had to get them restacked on the boat and like over here. Oh, so that's, crazy. That's like, I never would have known I'm so about sorry. That. <laughs> so, but it's coming and kind of fun. I mean, I know people were a little bummed because they were looking forward to planning their year, like backing up. I love how people do that. They'll like back up the training plan from race date and see where they can start or if they have enough weeks according to what the book says and um, so that's been kind of fun, but you asked for changes. It's so much bigger. <laughs> like yes. it's so much bigger. Here's the new edition. I'm super excited. Petey's on the cover with me. Yes. <laughs> yes. It looks so good. Local photographer, Ben Gronhout took the picture. We like scrambled one morning back in June and this was the best light we could get that day. And it was it's the only beautiful. day we had to do it. And it turned out great. It's on the Chuck and at 50 K course, which is 
also sweet. The other photos were uh, from Colorado because I was living in Boulder when the first edition came out right? or when the photos were taken. So a little bit more Pacific Northwest, which I was um, really excited about, but more relevant. Um, the training plans now are mirrored by a training log. So that's what makes up the bulk of the plan. So I really wanted this to be more of a manual and like, that's why it's paperback and this funky, I, the square shape. I want this thing like beat up, like but dog ear it. And this will really, I hope, encourage people to write in it and like highlight. Um, so that was a big update. The other one that uh, we came up with was that the table of contents is more like an index. So Excellent. before all of this information was at the beginning of each chapter. And so I would not call this a cover to cover read. So <laughs> it's a training manual. So like having those page numbers <clears throat> noted, so people can go in with specifics that they're looking for um, that like from the text, not just from the training plans, but from the text. I thought that was kind of a cool update. There's um, updated language. This is the example I've used on a lot, but there was one section that said you might want to care or have space in your pack for a phone, a GPS and a camera. And I was just in 2015. And now, your, now your phone does all of that. Like, yes, the phone's gotten bigger, but it does all three of those things. Right. That you don't have to carry three different devices. It's so funny. Well, I mean, 2015, they didn't even have phones, right? I mean, <laughs> they didn't have. I'm too young to remember 2015. Yeah. <laughs> <There we go>. <laughs> <laughs> totally. And then the last one I'll pull, pull out is I, you know, like I said, I'm in my mid 40s now. I added a chapter on longevity. So some things to make sure that this isn't just your first checkbox, do it once ultra, that you find this as a, like a practice of life. Like this is a lifestyle, not just a, a thing you, you did or maybe do once. I love the sort of transition to a manual, literally having an yeah. index at the front. It's like a table of contents uh, index. Where you can literally search by terms. What a brilliant way to, to format the book in a way that I think will apply to people who want to go back to your book regularly rather than read cover to cover you know it might be you're in the midst of a training cycle and you're like oh well, i gotta grab i gotta figure out if, if there's something you're looking for whether it's a speed workout or something you'll have a table of contents that you can actually search for that term rather than mm -hmm. having to shoot what page what chapter was that that uh, <laughs> what paragraph of that chapter that's exciting i like that i can't wait to get well, can i add one more one more one no more. no chris yes. <laughs> of course <laughs> <laughs> is I reached out to, I think it was about 20 or 25 people that I see as pillars in our sport. And they got to write whatever they wanted to write. I didn't prompt. I just prompted with what would you want to say to the athlete that's going to read this book? And then I got to plug those quotes into various places throughout the book. And that was so fun to add those voices throughout the book. So that's something, um, something else for people to look for. It's not just me. They get to hear from other people too. And the, one thing that we've learned just by having the GR crew and the community around any video that we post on the channel, whether it is just a shoe review or it's a movie uh, or a documentary of some race, is the voices from the community speak volumes. Like you'll hear so many amazing stories and and that's what sort of continues to, to weave this fabric of Ultra. I love that you incorporated that too. I can't wait to get my hands on it, Chrissy. Yeah. This is it's awesome. Coming. You guys get an advanced copy. There's a Ginger Runner Live mentioned in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I am, uh, before we get to the question, I know, oh, Kim, yeah. you pulled a bunch aside. Uh, where will people be able to find the book or pre-order the book now before we uh, transition out of the conversation? Because I want to make sure that you get the most, what is the best place for people to get it so you benefit the most? Like I've, people obviously want to support you the best. So what is oh, the best place? That. There on my Instagram handle, I put a link tree and there's 10 different uh, vendors that are selling the book for pre-orders. My website is one of those. So it's kind of funny. If I sell the book on my website, I don't get the like pre-order credit in terms of numbers, but like financially that helps me the most. So yes. I just, if people are pre-ordering, that's awesome and appreciated. And um, either way, I'll send you either a book plate or, and, or I will send the copy if you order it off my website i'll send it directly to people i have i think i have 100 orders already that i personally 
get to send out. And so I was like, well, you see my office is filling up with cardboard for Chuck and I. I'm like, I'm going to have books in here too. Like poor Gretchen. <laughs> oh, the life of a race director where just like random boxes start showing up and yeah. it's, uh, you're just like, wait, what did I, I order? Yeah. I, oh yeah. These are muffin wrappers. I forgot. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Totally. Tons of live questions. You've been super patient. Uh, what do we got? Yeah, there's been several comments from people uh, like Vivian herself and Eric as well, who said that they both own the first edition and have been training off it and now have uh, pre-ordered the second edition already. Uh, Heather Reed, who is uh, going to be visiting you all the way from the East Coast to run Chuckana in a few oh, weeks, is asking, oh. uh, will the book be available at Packet Pickup at Chuckana? I sure hope so. I ordered 250 copies to be in my office. If they are here before race day, I will somehow get them in the U-Haul and have them. Actually, packet pickup is at Prime, so I can just haul them downstairs. <laughs> as long as they're here, I will have them here. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Deb Brunsfar asked, uh, Chrissy, did you update uh, to cover the 200 plus mile distance? I did not. That is not something I've personally done. I am coaching athletes on it now, and it's such a cool journey to work with them on it. I did not include that in this book, though. It's still up to 100 miles. Only 100 miles. Yeah, yeah <laughs> only 100 miles. I love it. Um, and Eric from earlier, Eric was our super chat earlier. Uh, Eric says, okay, real question. Is Chrissy still doing raw long weekend mileage for plans in the second edition or has she changed opinion to encourage time on feet instead? Second edition has already been ordered. Awesome. Thank you for the order. Um, it's, it's still similar to, mo to mileage. There are some of the workouts that are now in minutes and mileage. Hmm. So giving people kind of a gauge. I, I can't, I, it's hard putting a plan into a book because you're so specific or like being a coach and working with people online, I get to morph the plans that work with their life. And so to right. have it in a concrete book, like, I don't, I don't know who that end user is all the time. So it's trying to be like, if I say 20 minutes, 20 minutes for, you know, somebody like everybody could be a totally different mileage range. So I stuck with mileage to, to in my mind, like make sure they, they had enough under the belt, especially a first timer. I, uh, I did update the language to also like, as people are looking to do like, not just their first, but multiple is like knowing that you have this first experience under your belt and that factors forward. And what did you learn from that? So maybe you don't have to do as much mileage or maybe you need to do more, but I feel a lot of times, at least as, as I'm getting older too, I do better with less mileage and keeping up on my consistency. And, and I have to believe that that also has to do with the fact that I have so much mileage in my legs. Like if I didn't have all of that, maybe I would need a little bit up front, a little bit more up front, and then um, kind of figure it out from there. So not discrediting your previous ultras. Some people say, Oh, I'm so out of shape, but blah, blah, blah. muscle memory, it's there. Yeah, it'll come back. I believe in that. And, and just what you know you're capable of doing. Sometimes that can get you in trouble, though. Like, if you know you're capable of <laughs> running 100 miles, but you've only been running 20 miles a week and you try and go run 100 miles, that could be, that could be a problem. <laughs> yeah, uh, I know people who have had that claim to, not fame, but like, <laughs> oh, I only trained X amount of miles and I went out and ran this 100 and I did it. And you're like, well, you're lucky to be alive. Like, you're lucky to be <laughs> here to tell us that story because it doesn't always work out that way. Um, I want to let pe uh, I want to or let you, Chrissy, remind people where they can find the link to the book. Uh, maybe reach out in, in regards to coaching services as well, and where they can find more information on Chucking Up because it is coming up in just a matter of weeks. We're so excited that it's happening again. Uh, but we're going to wrap up the show. But I want to give you the opportunity to kind of remind people where they can go to follow up on any of these things. Oh, thanks. If you can spell my last name, then you can find me, which is kind of a <laughs> thing. And I'm not very creative on coming up with like nicknames or anything. So every, like my website is chrissymail.com and it's M O E H L. And on there, there's coaching, there's links to Chuckanut 50K. That race website is chuckanut 50 kracecom Um, yeah. And then Instagram's just my name. I'm not much of a Facebook person, but I do, um, I do like sharing things on Instagram. 
Excellent. And Chrissy's last name is spelled on the screen. You see right, right now as well. Over there. Yeah, we've got it on screen. I don't see that. <laughs> uh, again, a huge thank you to our wonderful guest, Chrissy Mail, for joining us on the show tonight. We are going to move into our after show. If you would like to join us, we'll have some additional questions for Chrissy. Uh, you can join the GR crew. Just head on over to patreon.com slash the ginger runner and you can join the crew. Thank you so much, Chrissy. We'll see you in the after show. Thank you guys. I'm a Patreon member. <laughs> Chrissy's going to be there both on camera and also in the chat. She is a GR yeah. crew member and we're, we're so stoked to have her. That is going to wrap up our show tonight, episode 387. But of course, before we do that, uh, we like to recognize members of the community who go above and beyond. We call it our GR crew member of the week. Uh, I'm going to throw the graphics up there. There it is, GR there crew member is. of the week. Uh, Kim, who is this week's GR crew member? Uh, so this week's GR crew member, this is not a running related uh, uh, accomplishment, but I thought it was very cool. It caught my eye uh, over on our Discord server. So this week's GR crew member of the week is Meg Leach. And Meg had started uh, rowing and training with a rowing team recently. Right. And there was this benchmark test that they do. I think, I believe it was two kilometer sprint test. And when Meg did it in December, she plays first on her team. So congratulations, Meg. Well done, Meg. Congratulations on being our GR crew member of the week. Thank you again, everyone, so much for tuning into tonight's live show. We're going to move right into the after show. If you are a GR crew member, we'll see you there. We'll also see you tomorrow for Daily Brew. Uh, otherwise, get out there, train hard, race harder, part of the hardest, and get Chrissy's book. Yes. Check out her link tree on Instagram. <laughs> you, you won't want to miss that one. Thanks, all. Have a great rest of your Monday. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Ginger Rock.